Asato ma sadgamaya, Tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, Mrityur ma amritam gamaya, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Om, lead us from the unreal to the real. <coughs> lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. <coughs> Good morning. Could we have the lights back? Usually the prayer works. Lead us from darkness unto light. But this, <laughs> this morning somehow... <laughs> <laughs> this morning the subject is the essence of all Vedanta and this is something that I've taken from a phrase by Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya in his uh, commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad and the Mandukya Karika you see Vedanta is the teaching embodied in the Upanishads. The Upanishads contain perhaps the most ancient living teachings on spirituality, spirituality at its most original and fresh. Um, that's what you find in the Upanishads. And the philosophy based on the Upanishads is called Vedanta. So that's what our Vedanta society stands for. The teaching is given in different Upanishads. There are many Upanishads. Among them, Mandukya Upanishad is the smallest. And the Mandukya Upanishad is probably the most powerful of all of them. In fact, in his commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad, Shankaracharya starts with this sentence. Sarva Vedanta Artha Sara Sangraha Bhutam Prakarna Chatushtayam what it means is this, what is, we are going to teach now, contains the essence of the teachings of all Vedanta. The text Mandukya um, is set up in this way. The Upanishad itself has, it's a very small Upanishad, has only 12 mantras. And it is embedded in a bigger book called the Mandukya Karika, which was composed by Shankaracharya's teacher's teacher, Gaudapada Acharya, in four chapters. So the four chapters are called Mandukya Karika. They are in verses and they are basically explanations of the Upanishad itself. So the Upanishad, surrounding it is the Mandukya Karika of Gaudapada. Upanishad is very ancient, but the Mandukya Karika of Gaudapada would probably date back to 1300 or 1400 years ago. Uh, just before the time of Shankaracharya. And then Shankaracharya, about 1300 years ago, wrote a commentary. Of course, all of this is in Sanskrit. Wrote a commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad itself and also on the Mandukya Karika. So the text is like this. The Upanishad and the Karika and then the Sanskrit commentary, all of this is in Sanskrit, and the commentary by Shankaracharya, this is how you study it. And there are further sub-commentaries. For example, Anandagiri wrote a commentary on the commentary of Shankaracharya. So, it goes on. Um, the Mandukya, as I said, is the smallest and very powerful. One of our teachers uh, put it this way. You know, some, sometimes um, you have these chilies in India which are very hot. And they're the smallest ones are sometimes the hottest ones. So, in Bengali there is an expression, Dhani Lanka. There's a small chili but which is very hot. And this uh, Mandukya Upanishad is like that. <laughs> a very hot, very small but very hot. In fact, um, there is, it, it is mentioned in one of the old stories that Hanuman once goes to Ramachandra and asks, how shall I get liberation? How do I get liberation, salvation, freedom, liberation, moksha? And Ramachandra tells Hanuman, study the Mandukya Upanishad. Study the Mandukya. And if you do not, and he, and he says, the words used are, Mandukya meka meva alam, 
Mumukshunam Vimuktai. The Mandukya Upanishad by itself is sufficient to give liberation to those who seek liberation. If that is not enough, then Ramachandra proceeds to give a list of 108 Upanishads to, uh, to Hanuman. <laughs> so it's better for us. We don't have time. We're living in the 21st century here in Manhattan. We are pressed for time. So it's really well designed for us. Very short. Give me, give me the truth, the distilled truth in a sense. And that you get in the Mandukya Upanishad. So if you want to be enlightened quickly, concentrate on the Mandukya. Uh, if, if you don't succeed, then there is this whole Vedanta 101 waiting for you, <laughs> 108 Upanishads. What does the Mandukya Upanishad teach? You see, recently we've been studying it, so that's why I decided to um, give a few talks. My idea is to give three talks on the Mandukya Karika. So this is the first of the three. We're going to talk about it this morning. And then next week, um, and then one more next month. There might be a fourth one the month after that in, in June. So two lectures now in April and one more in May. And then maybe a, possibly a fourth one in June. But today we'll talk about the essential teaching of the Mandukya uh, Upanishad. This is what we're going to talk about. What does it teach? It teaches exactly what all the Upanishads teach. And what do the Upanishads teach? What does Vedanta teach? And luckily it can be put, although the, although the literature is vast, but it can be put in one sentence. The Upanishads teach us that you are one with God. You are the ultimate reality. It is expressed in what are called the great sentences, Mahavakya. In different Upanishads, you find these sentences. They sum up the teaching of the entire Upanishad. What are these Mahavakyas? <coughs> Most famously, that thou art, tat tvamasi, which you find in the Chandogya Upanishad, one of the Upanishads, a much bigger Upanishad than the Mandukya. Then you find another great saying, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, that you find in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Another saying, Pragyanam Brahma, this very consciousness that you have right now, this awareness, this itself is the absolute reality. And Ayam Atma Brahma, this very self, this self itself, this is the absolute reality. You can see all of these four sentences, this last one is found in the Mandukya Upanishad itself. The Mandukya Upanishad contains one of the great sentences, Mahavakyas. So these four sentences, these Mahavakyas, great sentences, their message is the same. All of them say exactly the same thing, that you are the ultimate reality. You see, the basic teaching of the Upanishads is that there is an ultimate reality. This world that we experience and how we experience ourselves, these are all manifestations of that reality. And what are you or I? What are we, sentient beings? We are that reality. If only we would know ourselves truly, we would realize ourselves to be that absolute reality. That absolute reality in the Upanishads, in Vedanta, is called Brahman. Not Brahmin, which is a caste, but Brahman. Brahman literally means the vast. That is the closest word you've got in Vedanta to God. So Brahman is, is the vast. And the, in, the incredible teaching of the Upanishads of Vedanta is that you are Brahman. And if you realize yourself as Brahman, evidently we do not know our own Brahman nature. But if we realize ourselves as Brahman, then the promise is that you would overcome all sorrow, all suffering. The promise is that you would attain true, profound, lasting bliss. In Sanskrit, Atyantika Dukkha Nivritti, complete eradication or transcendence or cessation of suffering. Paramananda Prapti, attainment of bliss. You know, in a very general sense, this is the promise of all religion. Whatever religion, whether it's Hinduism or Buddhism or uh, Christianity, that you go beyond suffering. You attain to a state beyond suffering. You attain to a state of peace and bliss. In most religions, most approaches, it is given in mythical language in, um, uh, in terms of stories, in a kind of figurative, symbolic way. 
talk of heaven and God and all of that. In the Upanishads, in Vedanta, it's given in a very direct philosophical way based on experience and reason. Something that appeals to the modern person directly. It, we, 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 as if the truth is presented before us straight away. And nowhere more so than in the Mandukya Upanishad. So the essence of the teaching is that you are the ultimate reality. And if you would know yourself as that, then all your problems would be solved. You'd be able to overcome all the sufferings of life. So the prize is great. The promise is great. And therefore it's worthwhile to take a look at this teaching. There is no greater uh, uh, adventure in human life. No greater challenge in human life. No greater purpose or goal in human life than to know this and to realize it in our life, to make it a reality. Swami Vivekananda put it most simply. The goal of life is to manifest the divinity already within us. Basically the teachings of the Upanishads. Look at the language. Manifest the divinity already within us. Not just know it, but manifest it. Make it a living reality. That's what the Mandukya aims at. And it's powerful because it's small. Because it's small, all the teaching is compacted. There is no space for anything else. There are no stories. In other Upanishads, there will be cute little stories. The story of the little boy who went to the house of death, Yama and Nachiketa. Or the arrogant young student, Shweta Ketu, who learns a lesson in the highest philosophy from his father um, in the Chandogya Upanishad, where he hears that thou art. And so many stories are there in the Upanishads. And they are nice. They form a nice background place to start with. There are dialogues between teacher and student. None of that here. Straight away the teaching is given. And luckily, Gaudapada later on expands on that teaching in four chapters, which we shall see. But before entering into the essence of the teaching, a note of caution. Because the teaching is so direct, so powerful, often people are uneasy about it. Often people get shaken up about it. Often people misunderstand it and misuse it. There is a mature way of understanding this teaching and there is an immature way of understanding this teaching. And believe me, I have come across people who have misunderstood this and it can be dangerous. It's like a knife, if you don't handle it well, you can cut yourself. What is a mature way and what is an immature way of handling this? There are those who when, see there are those who listen to this and it, did, it does not make much of an impression. Uh, so in that case you are actually safe. <laughs> I remember um, there was a very senior Swami who came to the main monastery where we, are, we monks are trained near Calcutta. And he asked the teachers in the training center, what are you teaching these days? What are you teaching the novices? And the answer was, well we are studying the Mandukya Upanishad, the Mandukya Karika. And the senior monk, who was a disciple of the Holy Mother, he was shocked. He said, no, 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 don't teach the boys that. They will become atheists. See, that is the power. And I used to think, what atheists? We are not becoming atheists or theists or any. It doesn't seem to have any effect. I just learned something very nice. That's all. As long as you say that, you're safe, actually. It won't make any difference to you. The trouble begins when you begin to understand it. So the immature way of understanding it is this. The immature understanding, say, uh, the person who understands in an immature way says, Oh, I see. Then religion is all imagination. It's superstition. Then I don't care for religion anymore. The mature understanding is that this teaching gives us, does not falsify religion. It explains religion. It gives foundation to religion. For the first time, religion becomes real. Just a couple of days ago, a young man came excitedly to me and said, Swami, this teaching of the Mandukya, it actually makes all religion real. I said, you have understood correctly. The mature understanding of the Mandukya makes religion real. It gives a foundation for religion. I'll go so far as to say, without this knowledge, without this philosophical, rational foundation for religion, religion just becomes a tissue of beliefs. Especially in today's world, when you're challenged by the new atheists, you know, Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens or Sam Harris, they just fall, fall apart. But if you take this standpoint, what we're going to talk about today, and then you look at the challenges thrown by 
materialists or atheists, you find that you are impervious to these challenges. The answers are very clear, very obvious. I have seen a, a book by a Christian theologian written that he has taken the arguments. He says these arguments are most evident in uh, the Vedanta of India, but they are, there, they are the core teachings of the highest teachings of every religion. And the arguments of the new atheists are of no avail against these, uh, um, against these Vedantic teachings. And this is from a Christian theologian. That's the mature way of looking at it, that it provides a foundation for religion. It gives you an explanation for religion. Another immature reaction to it is, oh, now I know the truth. So I have no need to meditate. I stop meditating, no need to pray, no need to go to temples or churches, no need to you know, do uh, any kind of spiritual practice. I have realized the truth. I am Brahman, I am God. Immature reaction. Mature reaction is that I understand what is the need of those spiritual practices. For the first time, the, the, we find the proper place for those practices. What they can do and what they cannot do, what, what, why I need them and why I need to continue practicing them, uh, that becomes clear to me for the first time. That's a mature reaction to this teaching. An immature reaction is contempt. I've got the highest teaching now, so I immediately begin to see all of the teachings, philosophies, religions as lower. You know, it's for stupid people. Uh, it, I've got the real teaching now. That's immature. The mature reaction is all teachings, they are all valid at their level and they are all helpful. They helped me when I was at that stage and so they are, they'll be helpful to everybody. They'll have people at different levels, in different ways of understanding, they are helped by different teachings. So they are not to be discarded, not to be treated with contempt. What I expect is once we go deep into this, we will begin to get an understanding and begin to treat this understanding with, with maturity, not immaturity. All right. So with all that warning, uh, buyer beware. Now you will, your attitude will be, what's the big deal? Tell us, let's see what it is. So what is this teaching? It's a teaching this, that is the same as any Vedantic teaching. There is an absolute reality. This world is an appearance of that reality and you are that absolute reality. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya, Jiva Brahmaiva Napara. This is in Sanskrit. It's a very well-known saying in India. But the uniqueness lies in how the Mandukya approaches this teaching. It's a straight, direct revelation. Each of the Upanishads, they have their own way of giving this teaching and showing you how to realize it. Not only how to understand it, first of all, we must understand it, and then how to make it real in your life. The Mandukya does it in its own peculiar way. What is the unique approach of the Mandukya Upanishad? This is the topic. I have not started yet. So now we, are going to, <laughs> now we are going to start. This is the subject. What the Mandukya says is, when you know yourself truly as you are, you will know the reality. Right now, you do not know, we do not know who or what we truly are. And how to do that, how to know ourselves truly as we, as we truly are, that absolute, the Mandukya says, analyze yourself. How do you analyze yourself? The Mandukya gives us a technique, a path. This is the unique contribution of the Mandukya. So what is this? The Mandukya says, when you look at yourself, you will find four aspects. Three of those aspects are very well known to you. When you investigate those three aspects, we will show you there is a fourth aspect to you, which is the reality. That reality which we are going to teach. The first three are well known to you, but we are going to teach that, we are going to repeat it, so that it gives you a doorway to that reality. So what are these four aspects of the self? When I say self, the word used in the Mandukya is Atma. The uh, Sanskrit is Soyam Atma Chatushpat. This very self has four aspects. What are those four aspects? Remember, when we are talking about the Atma, we are not talking about some kind of mysterious thing, some kind of high sp philosophical speculation. What are we talking about? We are talking about you. We are talking about myself, one's own self. 
This very self, you have four aspects. What are these four aspects? The first aspect is the waker and the waking world. You see, we have three kinds of experiences throughout the day. We are awake. Right now, for example, hopefully. We, because Upan, the Vedanta has a way of is being soporific. It puts people to sleep. And we sleep and we dream. Even in our sleep, there are two experiences. One is a dream sleep. One is a dreamless sleep, deep sleep. So we have a waking experience, a dream experience, and a deep sleep experience. These are the first three aspects of the self. The first aspect of the self is the waking experience, where you are the waker and you have your waking life. Basically what we call my life. Here I am. Here is this body. I have, I'm this person here. And here is my world. This is what the Mandukya calls the first aspect of yourself. The second aspect of yourself is when you fall asleep and you forget this world. You even forget that you are lying on the bed and sleeping. And you generate a dream. And it does not feel like a dream at that time. It feels like another waking experience. It, you only call it a dream after waking up. So in the dream also you exist. In a dream you have a dream body. We have a body in a dream. We pe meet, meet people in a dream. It's almost like this. So it's just a little bit more weird. It doesn't feel weird then. It's only after waking up and we'll compare it. We say, oh, I was dreaming. And what a funny dream. What a strange dream. So a dream, that is, that is your second aspect. The dreamer and the dream world. Aspect two. And then comes a stage. Every day we experience it. Everything disappears. Blank. Darkness. We often think that from our point of view, it's unconscious. We are not conscious of anything. But what Vedanta says is, consciousness continues. It's just there is nothing to be conscious of. Instead of calling it an absence of consciousness, we call it a consciousness of absence. Instead of no experience, an experience of nothing. So deep sleep, that's another aspect. Because we do experience it. When we woke, wake up, do we not say, I had a strange dream, uh, I had a funny dream. And then we, do we not say, that I slept like a log, I didn't know anything, such a nice sleep I had. Uh, these expressions are there in different lang languages, in different cultures. I slept like a log, I didn't know anything. I was so relaxed and in deep sleep. So that's the third aspect of the self. We already got three aspects. The first aspect is the waker. Through the physical body we interact with the world. That's the waker. Remember all this um, analysis is happening where? Which stage are we in now? Of the three? Waking. The waking stage. So all of Vedanta generally goes on in the waking stage. So everything is done from this perspective. So from this perspective it looks like in the waking stage we use a physical body and interact with the physical world. It's an externalized consciousness. Instead of physical the word they used is thula, gross. Gross not in the sense which we use in America like an awful or messy. Gross just means physical. So there is a gross aspect or a physical aspect of the self, first aspect. The dream takes place entirely in our minds. Our dreams take place entirely in our minds. So the mind is called the subtle aspect because in respect to the physical body, it's subtle. It's inward, it's subtle. So the dreams which take place, the dream world and the dreamer, you can call it the subtle aspect of the self. Second aspect is called subtle aspect. So I'm saying second aspect, dream aspect or subtle aspect of the self. The third one, deep sleep. That is called by the Upanishad, the causal aspect. Not casual, causal aspect. Causal, why? Because just like a seed from which a plant emerges, can you see the dream? Can we look at the dream in this way? That, that is where everything else emerges from. I fall, fall into a blankness and from there emerges dreams, from there emerges waking. So can I, look at the, can I look at the deep sleep as a seed from which sprouts our waking experience, our dream experience? So the deep sleep would be cons considered as a cause of the other two. So that is called the causal aspect of the self. 
Now we have got three aspects. Physical or gross, subtle, which is the dream aspect, and the causal, which is the deep sleep aspect. You might say, so what? None of this is Vedanta. Vedanta has not started yet. The Upanishad says Vedanta, the real teaching is coming next. These three are, we are just repeating back to you, labeling your daily experience. Now by taking a closer look at this, we come to the real aspect of the self. That is, the Upanishad calls it the fourth aspect. In Sanskrit, Chaturtham. Chaturtham means fourth. Fourth aspect or another word used by Gaudapada is Turiyam. It's become a well-known term in Vedanta. Turiyam. Turiyam means the fourth. Turiyam literally means four. But it has come to stand for the real self, for the absolute. So Turiyam is a word which stands for the real nature. As distinguished from the waking self which you are in right now. So your real self is the Turiyam. This is going to be the real, the actual teaching of the Upanishad. It's usually at this point that I tell the story. I've told it a number of times, but I think I should tell you again. This is a story that I heard from a monk while taking a walk um, after supper. Supper there is at 4 p.m. Uh, in the Himalayas, in, in the Gangotri. Uh, we, we get our food and we, the monks, we, we go for a walk until it's dark. So while we was walking with one of the monks, beautiful scenery in the, in the high mountains, this monk told me a story. It's a well-known story in India of the great emperor Janaka, who was supposed to be a great philosopher and enlightened, um, spiritually enlightened, a knower of Brahman, and also an emperor. One day, um, this is before he became enlightened. So one day he goes to sleep and suddenly he's awakened. The emperor is awakened by the guards. Sir, your majesty, get up. We have been attacked by the enemy. And he quickly gets out of bed and he puts on his armor and he says, summon the army and the generals, we must go out and fight the enemy. And that night they set out and they fight the enemy and there's a terrible war. But poor Janaka, he loses the war, he is wounded and captured by the enemy and dragged before the conquering um, the, the enemy king. And the conqueror says, O oh, Emperor Janaka, because you are of royal birth, I shall not kill you, but I shall take your empire and you are exiled. Poor Janaka, what can he do? So he's exiled from his own empire and he walks and walks and he asks for food or drink and nobody, they're all scared of the new despot and they are saying that we can't help you, sir, because the new king is so powerful and so uh, tyrannical. He might punish us if we help you. Poor Janaka, he was the em emperor yesterday and now he can't even get a, a drink of water in his own empire. He walks and walks and the story is that he crosses the border. Next day, he crosses the border into the neighboring kingdom. So which leads me to think that the empire couldn't have been that big. <laughs> so, now he comes to the neighboring kingdom and tired and exhausted in pain and in despair and frustration. He finds poor people are being fed. There's a long queue. And um, it's like, like a soup kitchen you have here. So there it would be in India, it would be a khichdi kitchen. Kich khichdi is the <laughs> lentils and rice. And so he stands in queue and finally it's his turn. But by that time everything is finished in the big cauldron. But the man who is distributing the food, see I'm telling you the story, it was much longer actually. I'm telling, I'm condensing it. <laughs> so the man who is distributing the food, he says, look, you seem to be of noble birth. You seem to be a good person who's fallen on evil days. I can give you something, there's a little bit remaining, the gruel which is remaining at the bottom of the cauldron, I can scrape that and give it to you, do you want it? And uh, Janaka says, anything, anything, just give it to me, I'm, I'm so tired and exhausted and hungry and in pain. So he scrapes out whatever is left and puts it in a bowl and hands it to the erstwhile emperor. And with trembling hands, Janaka takes it and is about to put it to his lips where a kite swoops down, you know those birds circling up, it swoops down and it knocks the bowl from his hand and the bowl goes rolling in the dust and whatever was given in the bowl is scattered in the dust and Janaka can't take it anymore. He collapses in the, on the ground shouting, you know, in, in, the monk told me in Hindi, ha ha kar karte hue. 
in the hindi ha ha ka ha ha means just the opposite of the english ha ha <laughs> <laughs> the english ha ha is laughing in hindi it or in uh, sanskrit also it means alas Uh, so he says, alas, and he falls on the ground. And he sits up, wakes up, sitting on his bed, his heart pounding, looks around. He's sitting on his bed in the palace. And the guard comes running, sir, you shouted, is anything wrong? Now at that point, if he was an ordinary person, but he's a philosopher, but if he was an ordinary person, he would have said, oh, it was a nightmare. It must be the burrito which I ate before. <laughs> <laughs> Or whatever. But he's a philosopher. He doesn't say that it was a nightmare, it was just a dream. He says, was that true or is this true? Mm. Was such? Yeah, yes yeah, such. Was that true or is this true? And the sentry is uh, fuddled, befuddled. He says, what is that true or that this true? He, he gets scared and he goes to call the queen. And the queen comes storming in. Now what's wrong with the old man? What's up you that this time? I'm with, with you this time. So, and, and the emperor says, was that true or is this true? The queen gets confused and she calls the doctor who comes at daybreak and takes his pulse and says, sire, what is wrong? Is anything hurting? Is, what's the problem? Was that true or is this true? And this goes on. Next day in the morning, it's all over the town. It's long before... Uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and everything. Yes. But it spreads all over town. Gossip. The emperor has gone crazy. Now the great sage Ash Ashtavakra is visiting um, the city and he hears, he is the teacher of the emperor, and he hears that um, Janaka has gone crazy. So he says, okay, I'll go and pay him a visit. He goes to the court. And he sees the emperor sitting surrounded by all his finery, surrounded by his queen and, arm, uh, and generals and officers and ministers. But what's happening? People are coming, so maybe the minister comes with a file and, Emperor, please sign this. And he says, is that is, Was that true or is this true? <laughs> was that true or is this true? Was such? Yeah, yes, such. And he, nobody knows what to do. Ashtavakra says, Emperor, How are you today? And the emperor says, was that true or is this true? And Ashtavakra, because he can know the minds of everybody, he knows what's there in the emperor's mind. He says to the emperor, oh emperor, when you were rolling in the dust in defeat and despair and your, your empire had been snatched away by the invading king um, and you were in pain, everything was lost. You were humiliated. Uh, at that time, was all this there? Your uh, uh, empire, your power, your health and your um, uh, generals and your pomp and glory and the queen by your side. All of this which you see right now, was all this there at that time? Emperor for the first time, like awakening from you know, shock, he says, no, all this was not there. And all that defeat and despair and horror Is that here, or is all of that here now? Now you are surrounded by your power and glory. There's no problem at all. You're the emperor. All that problems, all those terrors and you know, anxieties and horrors, are they here now? The emperor says, no, that is not here now. In that case, O emperor, neither this is true, nor that is true. Mm. Now ye such, now wo such. Neither this is true, Not that is true. But it's not the end of the story. The real thing is coming now. And this is the beauty of the Mandukya. The emperor, great philosopher, remember, he gets shocked. He said, then is nothing true? Is there no truth at all? Neither the dreams are true, nor the waking is true. Then is there no truth at all? And the sage says, right at, at that time when you were rolling in the dust in despair and defeat, Ah. What you saw at that time, that's not true. But were you there or not? Did you see that or not? He says, yes, I saw that. And right now, surrounded by all this pomp of the world, your empire, everything, uh, which is not true. But are you here now? Are you seeing this? Are you experiencing this? He says, I cannot deny that. I am experiencing this. Then you were there and you are here. Yes. 
then neither that is true nor this is true but you are the truth na ye sach na wo sach tum hi sach neither that is true nor this is true but you are the truth now this teaching is this is beautiful story which illustrates the basic teaching of the upanishad what is the real self the waking self was not there in the dream the self in the dream which experienced so many things is not there in the waking we discount all those experiences then what is common yet there is something common you cannot deny that you experience the waking world you cannot deny that you experience the dream world whether that is true or false this is a different question but you experienced it that's the truth nobody can deny that nobody can take that away so what is that which is common to waking common to dreaming common to deep sleep waking dreaming and deep sleep keep coming and going throughout our days but behind it is one common consciousness one common awareness what is that one common awareness in which shine our waking worlds and our dream worlds and the deep sleep darkness what is that one common awareness that the upanishad calls the fourth aspect of the self it's not the fourth it's the real self in which the three apparent selves what are the three apparent selves the waking self the gross aspect the dream self the subtle aspect and the deep sleep self the causal aspect these three appear they dance their dances they live their lives and they disappear they come and go the the unattached witness that which shines in and through all of them that is the fourth so called fourth it's not really the fourth it is the, it is the one with respect to these three it is the fourth but actually it is the one which is appearing as these three that is what the upanishad tells in the seventh mantra of the upanishad this real self your real nature the absolute nature what we truly are the atman brahman turiyam whatever name you give it the absolute our divine nature whatever you call it that is most powerfully indicated in the seventh mantra of the upanishad perhaps the most powerful mantra in the entire vedantic literature which directly points to you points out to you your real nature what does it say what is my true self what is the real teaching of the upanishad give it to me i am ready and the upanishad says all right then listen what you truly are nanta pragyam na bahish pragyam nau bhayata pragyam don't worry i'll translate he says swami too much sanskrit i used to teach uh, when i first came from india i used to teach in 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 uh, hollywood and uh, there's this gentleman a self made man he's a millionaire and uh, um, you know very i think it was texan probably so he would sit at the back and he was very interested but he said one thing i don't like is too much sanskrit and so we came to a to an agreement when it was too much sanskrit for him he would raise his hand <laughs> so i said okay i i'll give you a an heads up when there's sanskrit coming and i'll i promise to translate everything immediately afterwards so what is the real self nanta pragyam na i'll translate nanta pragyam na bahish pragyam nau bhayata pragyam na pragyana ghanam na pragyam na pragyam adrishtam abhyavahadyam agrahyam alakshanam achintyam abhyapadeshyam ekatma pratyasaram prapanchopashamam shantam shivam advaitam chaturtham manyante sa atma sa vigyeya this is the the seventh mantra which points out your own reality the ultimate reality of the of of yourself and of the whole universe what is that nanta pragyam na bahish pragyam it's not the dreamer you are not really the dreamer you are not really the waker also this waking consciousness this this waking awareness waking self the gross aspect of the self you are not that either na pragyana ghanam you are not the deep sleeper also the one in the deep sleep which experiences the blankness you are not that also something in between now we have the pragyam no intermediate state sometimes people say why only three states why only waking dreaming and deep sleep why not there are there are coma uh, you know some people fall unconscious or there might be mystical states people get ecstatic states you know 
So what about one of those? Are those the real states? Those are what, what we really are? It says no, none of them either. Now bhayata pragyam. Are we talking about God consciousness, the, the awareness of God, the mind of God which knows everything? God is supposed to be omniscient. So are we talking about that? He says not even that. Here we are not even talking about God. We are talking about a reality beyond God. We are talking about a reality, the reality of God. So it's not, not the mind of God either. Na pragyam. So is it unconsciousness? <laughs> Not the waking awareness, not dream awareness, not deep sleep awareness, nothing in between either. Um, not even the omniscience of God. Then are we talking about like a stone or a, uh, or a, uh, you know, a rock, no consciousness like that, you know, blank, completely nothing? No. Na pragyam. Not, not unconsciousness also. Then, then next, adrishtam. This real self, it's not an object of the senses. You can't see it. You can't hear it. You can't smell it. You can't touch it. You can't uh, taste it. Agrahyam. You cannot use any of your motor organs. You can't walk to it. Will I get the real self if I walk to Benares or Vrindavan or Mecca or Jerusalem, the holy places of the world? No, you can't walk to the real self. Can I catch hold of it with my hands? No, you cannot catch hold of it. It's not an object for any of the motor organs. Agrahyam. Can you infer it? Most of science is inference. You get data collected by the instruments and then use your scientific hypothesis to have an inference about what it means, the data means. Can you infer that I must be something like that? No, it's not inference either. Alakshanam. Um, uh, it says, then, Abhyavahadyam, um, it is not Available for any kind of transaction. Can I use that real self for something? You can't use it. That's why we say the ultimate reality, Brahman or Atman, is totally useless. <laughs> I'm only joking because all use, all transactions of the world are based upon it. But it in itself is not available for use in this world. So, Abhyavahadyam, beyond any transaction. Can I at least speak about it, use words for it? Abhyapadeshyam. You can, no language can express it. It's beyond expression. Why is it beyond expression? I will not go into it today. There's a whole lecture on that. Why language cannot express the absolute. We often say in different philosophies, especially in, um, in Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, in uh, Buddhism, Madhyamika Buddhism, uh, we say that it is beyond, it's ineffable. It cannot be expressed by language. But why can it not be expressed by language? Uh, there are reasons for that. Uh, I have uh, given a talk called the paradox of language. Uh, the language of paradox. Advaita Vedanta and the language of paradox. If you google it, you will find that. It discusses why language cannot be used to directly express the ultimate reality. But here, let, let's just take it. The Upanishad says, Abhyapadeshyam, unnameable. No word can express it. Abhyapadeshyam. Can I at least think about it? Can I form an idea about it? Can I understand it? Achintyam, you can't. Oh, then it's hopeless. <laughs> they say, no, it's not hopeless. All of this was negative. You know what was denied here? First, what was denied here is the three aspects of the self. The real self is not the waker, not the dreamer, not the deep sleeper. What was denied here is the, the experiences we have in the waking, dreaming and deep sleep. What, what experiences do we have in the waking? Things that we can see and hear and smell and touch. What experiences do we have internally? Things that we can think and imagine. All of those are denied. The, it is not the waker, not the waker's world. It's not the dreamer, it's not the dreamer's world. It's not the deep sleeper, it's not the deep sleeper's blankness. Beyond all of that. Can you give me some positive indication? What am I really? Yes, now it comes. Ekatma Pratyasaram. The continuous eye cognition that you have. It is proved by the continuous eye cognition that you have. 
who experiences my waking life? I. Whatever that I is. And in the dream too, I dreamt. Like the teacher said, you were present in the, you are present here, you were present in the dream. That I, the emperor, the emperor can say, I am seeing this world. It may be false, but I am seeing it. I saw the dream, may be false, but I saw it. That continuous I, which is there in the waking, which is there in the dreaming, which is also there in the deep sleep. Only thing is, in deep sleep, we do not have the capacity to think because the mind has shut down. So there you cannot say, I am in deep sleep. If you say that, you are not in deep sleep. So, but what do we say? When we wake up and re reflect back upon our deep sleep, don't we say, I slept happily? Do we ever say that I am awake, but somebody else slept happily? No, that sounds ridiculous. I slept happily. What is that common I which survives the coming and going of the waking, dreaming and deep sleep experiences? Ekatma Pratyasaram. That is the one, the pointer that I points to. It's not, it, it, it's not even in itself the real self. It points to the real self. Hold on to that. Investigate that. Follow that. You will arrive at your real self. Arrive is within quotes. You are already that. That will become evident. What is that real self? Prapanchopashamam. The, it's a very beautiful word. It means the quiescence, the silence of the universe. Your real self is the silence of the universe. This is what is said in, in generally in Vedanta when you say the world is an appearance. Maya, Jagat Mithya. This is the meaning of this word, the silence of the universe. In you, the real self, this universe doesn't exist. It appears in you and it disappears in you, but really there is no universe in you. The, that, that real self is the ultimate reality. There is no such physical, subtle or even causal universe apart from you there. Silence of the universe, prapanchopashamam. Shantam. Because the universe is not there, it is peace itself. Your real self, the, your name is peace. It's not that you are peaceful. You are peace itself. Your, one of your names is peace. Shantam. And Shivam. Shivam means auspicious. Bliss. You see, originally what was the promise of Vedanta when we started? What, is, what does Vedanta do for us? It takes us beyond suffering and it gives us permanent, lasting, profound bliss. Here is the result. If you realize yourself as this fourth aspect, that which is beyond the waking universe, dream universe and deep sleep universe, in which the waking, dreaming and deep sleep universes arise and fall like waves in an ocean, that reality, it is forever beyond suffering. Shantam. It is, it is bliss itself. Shivam. Shantam Shivam. In fact, these universes which arise in you, the waking world and the dream world and the deep sleep darkness, these are basically, the, you know, in a poetic way you can say, these are waves of bliss arising in you. You the ocean of bliss. So, you are bliss itself. Shivam. Advaitam. Non-dual. Non-dual means Apart from you, that real self, there is no other thing. You are the only reality that exists. Apart from you, there is no second thing. Advaitam, not two. If there is not two, very interesting consequence, then everything that we see around you must be in some sense you only, not, not apart from you. It's not two, Advaitam. Chaturtam Manyante. People think it is the fourth. Fourth in respect of what? Wake other three. Don't forget the other three. Our usual experience of ourselves is the three. What are the three? The waking, the waker, the dreamer and the deep sleeper. With respect to those three, it seems to be the fourth. But actually, what the Upanishad tells us and what Ashtavakra told the emperor, that is the only reality. It appears as these three. These three are not real. 
The waker and the waker's world are not real. They are appearances of that Turiyam. The dreamer and the dreamer's world are not real. They are appearances of that Turiyam. The deep sleeper and the deep sleeper's merged darkness are not real. They are appearances of that Turiyam, which is not gross, which is not subtle, which is not even causal. Beyond the gross, subtle and causal, but which appears as the gross universe right now. Which appears as the subtle universe in your dreams and which appears as the deep sleep darkness in your deep sleep. That one basic consciousness, fundamental consciousness, unchanging awareness, it seems to be the fourth, but actually it is the one. That thou art, sa atma, that's your real self. The whole point is to shift the reference of this I. When you say I, right now what does it mean? It means the waker. When I say I, it means the waker. The Upanishad wants you to shift the reference of the I to the Turiyam. The one consciousness beyond the waker, dreamer and deep sleeper. So that I, Sa Atma, what has to be done? Sa Vigyaya, that is the word used. It has to be realized. First hear it, then understand it, and then immerse yourself, soak yourself in that truth till it becomes a living reality. It is a living reality. But because of our ignorance, we don't get it. We don't, we don't get it. We are sort of half awake. We think that we are this waking world, this body and this mind, this particular person. This is who we are. Note that all troubles are in the waking world or in the dream world or even in deep sleep. How? Where were the emperor's troubles? In the dream world. In the waking world, everything was okay, but there's a potential for trouble. <laughs> waking world is full of potential for trouble. You can have trouble from other people, you can have trouble at the physical level, you can trouble at the, at the mental level. So much suffering and anxiety and struggle is there. Waking world. In dreams also, there can be trouble. Nightmares, anxieties, many dreams of you are haunted by, by fears and troubles in dreams. And when we wake up, we say that, okay, we are saved, it's not real. But when you're in the dream, it seems pretty real and you suffer, actually suffer. Now you might say, in deep sleep there is no trouble. Right? In deep sleep, when you're not aware of the world, you're not even aware of yourself, just blankness, what trouble can there be? Even the sickest person, poorest person, person who's most ill and dying, when that person goes into deep sleep, not even aware of any of the problems. But, in deep sleep also there are problems. In what sense? The seeds of all the problems of the waking and the dreaming are there in deep sleep. Because, what's the proof? When you wake up from deep dream, all the problems are there. You've still got um, um, a mortgage to pay off and you still have family problems or relationship issues, you have health issues and you have social issues. There's so many problems and issues are there when you wake up. That means if the deep sleep is considered to be causal, it was all there in the seed form. It all comes up when you wake up or when you go into a dream. So the deep sleep, though it may not have any expressed problem, the seeds of all problems are there in deep sleep. And those problems are experienced in waking and in the dream state. So problems are always there in the three states. But in the one reality beyond the three states, no problem. So the Turiyam, the real self is free of problems. It is bliss itself, it is peace itself. And the Upanishad says, you are that right now. Recognizing yourself as that, realizing yourself as that, then live your life in the waking state, in the dream state, in the deep sleep. You are not affected by any of it. How will you not be affected by it? Like this. One is, the Turiyam itself, the real, the real you, is the word used is Asanga. It is not attached to anything. Nothing sticks to you. You are super Teflon. <laughs> Think about it. The entire waking world with its problems. How many times it has come before you and how many times disappeared? You exist. Hmm? One Swami put it this way. Uh, you know, people 
who fall in love with another person or with with their dog or something you know i can't live without my little, little puppy the little dog is there and the swami said these great lovers who can, who say that i cannot live without that person or that little dog or this this you know whatever it it might be the object of love so many such persons have come and gone so many such dogs have come and they have died this person is for living <laughs> <laughs> you still exist you may suffer because of attachment but it, your existence is not dependent on what you are attached to problems in the world have come and gone persons in the world have come and gone our own bodies from babyhood to childhood to let me give you the exact phrase that swami used in the himalayas it is in hindi it has pungent force in hindi i don't think if i can translate it to english he said Uh, mahatma mahatma means monks oh monks ye jo premi log hote hain na these lovers who are there in the world kitno kitno ko maar ke jiye hue hain abhi tak <laughs> they have witnessed how many the deaths of how many people and they are still continuing now but this says something interesting about us each of us that the consciousness the experiencing self which we are is immortal it is not touched by the experiences of the world it is basically asanga unattached waking dreaming deep sleep come and go people come and go events keep happening our body changes from babyhood to childhood to youth to middle age to old age diseases come and go and finally the body dies we experience all of that untouched this fourth aspect this real aspect the one aspect turiyam is untouched by the happenings good or bad in the waking dreaming and the deep sleep darkness another deeper reason why is it untouched how is it untouched it's because it is consciousness consciousness the word used in sanskrit is prakashaka it's simple like the light here the light here falls on everything in this room and illumines everything and yet the light is untouched by the objects which it illumines it can illumine and the classic example is sunlight illumines um wine in a pitcher uh, muddy water in the drain uh, the ganges water which is considered holy in india ganges water in in another pitcher the light which falls upon them is not made impure by the wine or the muddy water not made dirty by the muddy water it's not made pure by the ganges water it shines upon all of them equally and not affected that which illumines prakashaka is not affected by which it illumines the object illumined does not affect the light similarly you the consciousness you are not affected by the people you experience who come in your experience by the events which happen in your experience by the body which you experience even by the thoughts that you experience good thoughts bad thoughts how many times they have come and gone you are the same consciousness because you are prakashaka illuminer that's why you are not affected and a deeper third reason why you are not affected by the problems of the three states waking dreaming and deep sleep the deeper deepest reason is because this turiyam your real self is satyam reality and the waking dreaming and deep sleep are mithya appearances the appearance cannot affect the reality example a classic example when a rope is mistaken as a snake in vedanta we use the rope snake example a classic example there is no snake by mistake we see the rope as a snake now that false snake the snake which we see by error will that false snake make the real rope poisonous does that snake affect the rope not at all the water in the mirage in the desert you see there's a lot of water there like an oasis but when you go there you see it's just a mirage there's no not even a drop of water but it looks like water that water can it wet shankaracharya uses this language in his um, commentaries the water of all the water of a mirage cannot wet even a grain of the desert sand because because 
compared to the illusion, compared to the water, the desert sand is real and the water is an appearance there. It's not real water there. That which is an appearance cannot affect that which is real. From the consciousness point of view, from the Turiyam point of view, even the so-called real world of the waking, or the dream world, or the deep sleep darkness, they are all appearances. How many times has the waking world come up in you? How many times disappeared? How many times dreams have come? How many times disappeared? How many times has the deep sleep darkness come? How many times disappeared? You are the same and unaffected. Because you are asanga, unattached. Because you are prakashaka, the illuminer. Because you are satyam, real, while they are appearances, mitya. This turiyam is completely unattached, completely the, the, the ill, unaffected illuminer, the reality behind the appearances. It is the magician of the magic show of the world. The magic show of the world has three acts, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. I just coined that, that's good. Actually. <laughs> when Shakespeare says, this, the acts of man, you know, the, the, all the world's a stage, but the, all that he includes in the waking state. So all of that, plus our dream, plus our deep sleep, all of those are the acts on the stage which you are. Stage is unaffected by the act. You are, it's the three movies, or two movies, waking movie and dream movie. And the uh, intermission, the darkness of deep sleep, which play on the screen. The screen is not affected by the comedies and tragedies which play upon it. Taking that position, such a high position, then everything becomes, you see, somebody said, and everything becomes entertainment to the jnani. Even if we understand this intellectually to some extent, it's productive of great peace. You can now live in your world as the waker, as the dreamer and the deep sleeper in complete harmony and joy and peace, knowing your real self to be the Thurium. What is its relationship with um, religion, with spiritual practice? After this session, we'll have a question-answer session today, a little later, where you can raise all these questions and we can deal with them. But to complete the talk, just a couple of more points and then I'll be done. Because we're talking about the Mandukya Upanishad. The Mandukya Upanishad, Gaudapada points out, all this is a play of ignorance and error. Ignorance and error. Not knowing the rope, we make the error that it is a snake. What is the basis for making the error? Not knowing, ignorance. Ignorance is the basis for making any error. To think that I am this waking body and mind, this person, it's an error. It's based on ignorance. Ignorance of what? Of Turiyam, my real self. So Gaurapada compares and contrasts and makes a nice study of that. I'll give you the, the gist of the study. What he says is this. The waker is under the spell. Waker. Us. Us, right now. Now you are a Mandukya Upanishad student, you should say, our app the apparent us, the real me is the Turiyam. Make the shift that I am the Turiyam, I am the witness. When I appear as the waker, if I do not know myself as the witness, if I think that I am the waker, then I am subject to both ignorance and error. Because I don't know I am the Turiyam, and then I have the error, I am the waker, this person. The dreamer is also has the same problem. Ignorance and error. The dreamer also does not know that it is the Turiyam and therefore sub is subject to the terrors of, of the nightmares and all. And the deep sleeper does not know anything. Does not know the Turiyam, does not know itself, does not know the world, blank. So it is subject to ignorance but not error. Note, waker has ignorance and error. Dreamer has ignorance and error. Deep sleeper has only ignorance. The Turiyam has neither ignorance nor error. From the Turiyam perspective, I know that I am Turiyam. I use the mind itself to reflect upon the fact that I am Turiyam and I am not subject to the error. Body and mind may appear, I may act with the body and mind, I may act through the body and mind, but I am not under the error that I am the body and mind. It will change, it will go in its own way, one day it will die, I am not affected by it. Not only I am not it, but these are not even real. They are appearances in me, the consciousness. 
So this is what Gaudapada says. One, just uh, something to be pointed out. Often we slip into an error when we talk about Mandukya Upanishad. What is the error? And it has to be understood carefully. We talk about three states. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep. So the waker is a... Where, where do you find the waker? In the waking state. Where do you find the dreamer? The dream state. Where do you find the deep sleeper? In the deep sleep state. Now when the Upanishad talks about something called Turiyam, we immediately think, oh, there must be a Turiyam fourth state in which you can find the Turiyam. Big mistake. Big mistake. The classic example which I always give is of, of um, gold and the ornaments. The same gold can come to you as a necklace, as a golden bangle, as a golden ring. Right? And somebody comes and tells you, the reality is something called gold, a fourth thing. And will you then throw away the ornaments and look for gold somewhere else? You cannot. It's not a fourth ornament. Gold is not an ornament. Gold is the reality of these ornaments. <laughs> Similarly, Turiyam is not, though it's called the fourth, it's not a separate state. It's a reality of these three states. It is that which appears as the waking. It is that which appears as dreaming. It is that which appears as deep sleep. If that is so, where is Turiyam available? Where is waker available? Right now you are the waker. But where is Turiyam available? Ah, this you must say with confidence. The ultimate reality, the pure consciousness, Atman, Brahman, God, Turiyam, whatever you call it, is available right now. Where is it available? Right here. And who is it? Myself. <laughs> yes, this you must say with confidence. Turiyam is not available elsewhere. It's available right here. Turiyam is not available later on, some other time. In heaven, after death, after I get samadhi, after I get enlightenment, Turiyam will be available. No, no, no. When you take a golden bangle, if I ask you, is the gold available there or not? If a child knows it's a bangle but does not understand what is the gold, a little girl wears a bangle and does not understand what gold is, just think it's a bangle, it's my bangle. Even if the girl is ignorant of the fact that it is gold, isn't the gold available, gold available right there? Similarly, even if we think that we are in ignorance, we do not know our true self, that true self, that Turiyam, it must be available right here. It must be me. It's available now, it's available here and it is you. The implications are tremendous. Implications for religion, for philosophy, for spiritual practice, for our life. They're tremendous implications. Which we will talk about today and in the forthcoming lectures. So this is one mistake you must not make. That the Turiyam is something else. Somewhere else. And somebody else. Some other time. You see a billboard. I mean, I was, yesterday I was driving along. I saw two billboards. First billboard <coughs> said... Heaven is a place. Call 855 for the truth or something like that. <laughs> that means it's some other place, right? Not this place. It's a place. Turiyam is not, a, not some other place. It's right here. Another billboard which came a little later. After you die, you will meet God. Call 855 and so on and so for the truth. <laughs> that means time. Time. You are separated from the reality by time. After you die, after you go to heaven, or after you get samadhi, after you get enlightenment. No, not after anything. Right now. And it is right here, right now, and you. So don't make the mistake of saying the fourth state or some Turiya state, some other thing. Right. One last thing and I'm done. The last thing is because it is the Upanishad and I must mention it. The Upanishad gives you a technique at the end, which is called Omkara, Om. The word Om is a sacred word used in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, all the Indian religions. They consider it very holy. And in Vedanta also it is used, of course, it's central. The Mandukya Upanishad prescribes Om. What it says, I'll tell you in brief and then conclude. What the Mandukya says is a good way of understanding these teachings is use this as a support. Om, the word, has three syllables. 
a, the Sanskrit a, it's often written as a, but it's not the English a. It is a. The sound you make when you open your mouth, a. Then the next syllable is u. And the third one is m. Not in English you write a u m. It's not a u m. It's a u m m. So if you will pronounce it together, don't pronounce it as aum. I, I saw somebody pronouncing it. It's, that's not correct. Because the, by the rules of Sanskrit grammar, when you bring a and u together, it becomes o. So om is the correct pronunciation. A, u, m pronounced together becomes om. Now what the Upanishad teaches is, do this. Think about yourself now and your waking world. The waker and the waking world in your mind make an... It's an exercise. Make an association. Waker and the waking world call it a. Uh, what will you call it? A. Uh, in your mind. And imagine your dreams. Some kind of dream. Whatever you dream. When you forget the waking world and you're lying in, in your bed and dreaming. Associate that dreaming in your mind now, in the waking itself. Associate it with ooh. And then associate the deep sleep experience. Now itself. Not in deep sleep. Now itself. That absolute blank, I don't know myself, I don't know the world, I'm in totally in deep sleep. That one associated with mmm. So, a, uh, u, mmm. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Waker and the waking world, dreamer and the dream world, and deep sleep and the deep, deep sleeper and the deep sleep darkness experience. So, that is a, uh, u, uh, mmm. Now, when you recite it, don't recite it separately. Don't keep on reciting a uh, or u uh, or um. Recite it together. Om. Like that when you recite it. Mentally go through these experiences. Quickly. The waker, gone. The dream and the dreamer, gone. Deep sleep, blackness, nothing, gone. Again the waker comes. Now when you, re when you do this, between one Om and another Om, when one Om fades away, before you start another Om, you can do it loudly or you can do it mentally in your mind. If you're in the bus or the subway, do it in your mind. I highly recommend it. <laughs> the silence in between, let that in your mind represent the Turiya. That silence is not only between one Om and another Om, it is also underneath each Om. It is the silence from which the a uh comes, it's the silence from which the oo uh comes, it's the silence from which the um mm comes. And all of them fall back and merge back into that silence. That silence is there always. It's not a silence which contradicts sound. It's a silence from which sound and silence both come. So it is that underlying, the great silence underlying. That, associate that with Turiyam in your mind. So when you do this om, Note the waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Note the silences in between referring to the real Turiyam, the real self Turiyam. Do this, the concepts of Mandukya will become very clear. And you will also be able to become established in the real self. When you rotate in your waking state in, as an exercise, when you rotate the waker and the waking, dreamer and the dreaming, deep sleeper and the deep sleep, in your mind one after another quickly, <coughs> you will begin to see a separation between them and yourself. That separation is important because that points to the real self, the Thuriyam. This is what the Mandukya Upanishad, first chapter, this is what it teaches. The second chapter, it dwells entirely trying to explain what it means, the falsity of the world. What does it mean really? Why is it important? Why is it so spiritually significant? That we will talk about in the next talk, uh, next Sunday. Today, uh, within a few minutes, we shall start a second session, which is a question answer. So I'm, I'm sure you have questions. So uh, hold those questions. We will start in a few minutes. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu Namastu